Buenos. Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for coming, especially given the context and the environment regarding coronavirus, where concentrations of people are not recommended. So thank you very much for being here with us uh, to talk about data and privacy in the digital era. It's always very nice for me to welcome you in this space of Espacio Fundación Telefónica, which is a perfect place to share and exchange different viewpoints. I would like to start by thanking the responsibles for the um, of the Center of, for the Governments of Change uh, of Instituto de Empresa, the people with whom we started this project and also the Executive Vice President of the IE University and Carlos Luca de Tena, who has taken the lead of the project in the past months, and obviously uh, to Carissa Vélez, the researcher who is the protagonist of the research project that we are introducing today. We have been working with them for the past two years the, uh, on this uh, report, Data, Privacy and the Individual, to understand better what ethics and privacy mean in the context of data. And I would also like to thank the presence of uh, Ricardo Martinez, uh, Karina Bold, and uh, Christophe, who would be in the round table, who, which will be moderated by Raquel Carretero, and that will enable us to share different visions and experiences about the topic that has gathered here as all today. The world is becoming increasingly digital and data uh, everywhere. Uh, we might ask who is not using any types of apps or services that generate data and who is not using their maps or their digital contact lists uh, in order to communicate with other people in their digital devices. And these data actually improve and benefit society and people uh, figures are impressive. For 2025, we expect to have 100 billion connections producing data. Uh, autonomous uh, cars uh, generate just by themselves as many data as 3,000 people. So imagine the amount of data when uh, the roads are filled with self-driven cars. And it's a proof is that uh, of all this is that the flows of data have increased faster than the um, trade of goods or the money transfers in the past 40 years. Um, the data are necessary for the algorithms that are used by companies and governments. This is why data are sometimes called the new oil. They are seen as a vast and very valuable uh, asset that technology companies can exploit as a consequence of the digital revolution and the multiplication of the digital data. Um, in the past years, we have witnessed an increasing concern regarding pri privacy for the data economy. It's key that people trust the way these data are used. And of course, this has raised many concerns uh, because they might they fear they might lose the control over their digital lives and this has increased the concerns about the final use of data the emergence of uh, businesses based basing their business model on the use of data or the malpractice of several companies and we cannot forget of course Cambridge Analytica have generated increasing um, mistrust among the citizens. This situation uh, raised the concern about the fact that data had been shared without the knowledge or consent of the interested uh, parties and sometimes for uses such uh, as bad as uh, interfering with the election results in a country. We are concerned about privacy and safety and this also is a danger for the new world of opportunities and the greatest potential of this new digital era can only be achieved if people trust companies. Therefore, uh, digital trust is a key element. Europe has been leading the path in order to create trust and putting into value the privacy of its citizens through several regulations. We have the GDPR and this is 
a practice that has been accepted uh, worldwide and it came from Europe. But beyond the legal aspects, companies uh, have a very clear responsibility. We need to defend values and make a responsible use of data in order to generate trust in the digitalization and in the digital revolution that we are experiencing at this moment. Telefonica wants to be le a leader in, in this debate and to be so in a responsible manner. This is why three years ago we established a privacy uh, norms that were implemented in our digital manifesto and that we still use as a base for the development of a digital area based on values. Uh, first of all, transparency is key, uh, especially regarding the gathering and the use of data. This is a first step towards allowing customers and consumers to benefit from a reasonable use of these data. Second aspect would be safety. Data should be protected and safe. This should be a base for the new, uh, cre for the creation of new business models, empowerment. People must have control of their data. They need to have the right to determine their level of safety and the, the use we make of these, their data. We should be able to choose how these data are being used and not going to extremes of for nothing or for anything, but establishing different levels in order to preserve the principles that we stated before. This would allow the new data economy to develop fully and also to it would allow society to benefit from all the advantages provided by digitization digitalization. Telefonica is also leading the path towards um, ensuring the safety of the data of our customers because they, these are part of our key values. The new transparency center that we have intended to launch in a few weeks will be a product that will be implementing the new vision of empowering our clients. We will allow uh, users to activate or deactivate the different uh, levels of um, permits or, so that we can use their data for different purposes. This uh, also has to do with the control by the users of their own data. With today, we wanted to push forward research that go further, that goes further and that explore the ethics of privacy as a result of the work that has been carried out. The report that will be introduced um, in a minute in covers um, a study of covering more than 1,000 people and the differential privacy is analyzed in this study. This is a system that allows to present information about a group of individuals but saving and protecting at the same time the privacy of each of these individuals at a uh, personal level. We are concerned in guaranteeing the privacy and increasing the transparent transparency of the data of the use of the data that we make. We hope that this will start a debate that we hope will be fruitful about data and citizenship and this will be continued in the digital forum in the digital policy lab as we call it and I recommend that you visit it. It's a forum where we want to debate and obtain certain conclusions about different policies in the digital environment. I will leave now the floor to Diego de Alcázar de Jumea, who is the vice, executive vice president of uh, the, the Instituto de Empresa, and I thank him again for his presence here today with us. Muchas gracias, Pablo. Muy well. Thank you very much, Pablo. Good morning, everyone. I would like to start by expressing my gratitude to Telefónica and in particular to the public policy team for their great support and involvement in the development of this project. The report that we are presenting here today is, comes from uh, many months of uh, collaboration work and a 
an excellent record of collaboration between the two institutions. The aim of our institution, of course, is to keep strengthening the relationships by establishing uh, exchanges that generate knowledge and uh, useful debate for the uh, citizenship as the one that we are studying here today. We also see the culmination of the works on data privacy and the individual that we started two, over two years ago from the Center for the Governance of Change collaborating with the Digital Policy Lab with, of Telefonica. The goal of this project is twofold. On the one hand, we look for, um, we aim at generating knowledge uh, about the technologies that are uh, being used by our societies and sometimes we see that there are no rigorous or strict analysis based on scientific uh, research and also we try to give our own answers and recommendations so that organizations can know how to navigate among these challenges. Uh, these are changing greatly the way governments, companies and citizens relate to each other and we consider that in the current context this type of exercise has become uh, more necessary than ever and this is why all the projects of applied research that we carry out from the Center for the Governance of Change have this twofold goal. It's very probable that the acceleration of the social uh, change will lead to more prosperity in the future but if we cannot analyze and understand how these processes are articulated, we will find ourselves with uh, having to face very uh, difficult uh, problems regarding governance, the, treat the processing and the use of data in the digital area is one of these processes that present challenges to the companies and to our governments, but it's also a challenge that is great uh, in the in terms of the privacy for the citizens at a time where the debates tend to be more and and more short term and that in many cases do not aim at finding uh, an understanding that reaches that is cross borders or that touches many disciplines we think that the conclusions that we are presenting here today are, will be very useful for the data era and the technological times uh, for governments. And this also demonstrates the commitment of our institution in terms of transmitting and conveying knowledge and also how involved we are in trying to find answers for new challenges in a world that is changing very fast. The innovation spirit is something that we see in our center. Um, in a continuous manner and the work that we are carrying out in terms of regarding the emerging technologies just comes to prove this. We work on an international platform that adds different talents from different organizations and in order to develop this research we created a multidisciplinary team uh, encompassing 15 experts from different institutions led by Carissa Velith, who will um, contribute to the debate in a, very shortly. And they dealt with the ethics and the processing of data, the informed consent or the anonymization of the data. And they also carried out a survey on over 1,000 citizens regarding the monetization of data, among other topics. The report that we present today is a synthesis of all these works in order to suggest several principles and recommendations regarding privacy and ethics in the gathering, the use, and the exchange of data. We, I recommend that beyond just listening to the presentations and the exchange exchanges among the experts today you devote some time to reading the re, the re report in order to understand better how we can improve our organizations regarding ethics and the privacy of data all the handouts and all the deliverables that i have uh, mentioned before are already available in the URL that you can see on the screen. I will not take more 
of your time since you have come here to listen to the experts, but I would like to leave you with a final reflection that I think is very interesting in order to put this debate into context. One year ago, the lawyer and systems auditor uh, said in an interview in El País that it was more uh, dangerous to have Alexa on the table than having a gentleman looking at you every day in your living room. This might seem like a joke, but among citizens there is a very low perception of the risk when it comes to the acquisition and the processing of their personal data. None of us would let an, a stranger come into our house. However, we feel very comfortable having our smartphones or gadgets such as Alexa who are listening to us 24 hours a day. I do not want to raise uh, unnecessary alarm among you, but it's important that we understand that from our privacy there depend many things, from the exercise of democracy to uh, individual freedoms. So I would leave you the I would leave the floor to Carissa so she can tell you about the interesting reflections and conclusions of this report. Thank you very much to everyone. Thank you, Diego, and thank you everyone for being here. I would also like to thank in particular Telefonica for supporting this project and obviously Liam. Um, this has been a very uh, nice and very interesting collaboration. And I would also like to say thank you to Diego Rubio, who is the one who really started this initiative, and, and Carlo, Carlos uh, Luca de Tena. Uh, Juan Luis Redondo and uh, Paloma Villa um, and Carlos Steck also who have been the uh, Christoph Steck who have been part of the core team also Kevin McNeish from the Twenty University he wrote about the concept of privacy and uh, informed consent Alfred Archer and from the Tilburg University wrote a very interesting paper about the different models for data gathering and the ethical benefits and the costs entailed in those. There's another paper about data being handled as a private property or not and what would be the differences. There are other authors, authors dealing with the data in the context of advertising, but we are lucky enough to have Karina here to tell us about it. Um, also other authors wrote about the differential privacy and they have done a great work because differential privacy is a method that was suggested in 2006 by uh, Cynthia Walk. And it's very difficult to find experts who uh, know much about this topic. This is a very interesting procedure because it allows you to analyze data without endangering people's privacy. So the principle is to have a database where you can input enough uh, mathematical noise to camouflage, to cover each of the participants or the people in that database, but not enough uh, to mask any question, the, the answer to any mathematical or statistical question that we might ask this database. This is a very promising uh, method, but we need um, experts in mathematics to develop it properly. Aside these seven papers, we also ran a survey about uh, people's perception on privacy, and the results were extremely interesting. One of the questions that was brought up by this survey is that most of the people have had bad experiences, at least one bad experience with their regards to their privacy. Most of all have experienced something like that. We, uh, the, the number of our credit card has been stolen or a friend or an, a foe has exposed some information in Facebook that we wouldn't have liked to be exposed or that one product 
uh, we paid more for one product than somebody who lived in a different neighborhood, for instance. And this is very interesting because 10 years ago or six years ago when I started working on this, people were telling me uh, that privacy doesn't exist anymore. You arrived late at this field and they told me that I was actually dealing with history. So one of the challenges is to understand that privacy can be very abstract when the you go to the doctor and they ask you to ask your consent to use the knife and it's very clear the, the risks are very clear and you have very clear in your mind what can go wrong but when a company asks you for your consent to use your data the risks are not so clear it doesn't hurt to be robbed of your data at least not at the beginning maybe the pain will come later, but by that time it's too late. So it's very interesting to understand how this topic is evolving because as we gather more experiences, first-hand or second-hand experiences of the way um, the ma bad use of our data can cause harm, um, more surveys will come up and more results and conclusions will come up. Another factor that has been very interesting is that people are not only concerned about uh, their privacy, actually about almost 90% of people uh, consider privacy to be one of the higher um, risk elements in the digital society. But not only because this can affect our reputation or we can be stolen of our money, but also because people are starting to see it again as a good in itself, not something that is a tool that allows us to have other things or to reach other things, but also as a good in, in itself. So, something that we have also found through this survey is that peop most of the people do not believe that governments should gather information at a massive level, that it should be uh, more weighted. Also people think that privacy is a right and this is why many people are not ready to pay for it, not because they do not care, but because they think it's a right that they it's owed to them, so it should not be on the citizens to pay for this and uh, companies and governments should respect this, this right that we have. Regarding the papers and the surveys, uh, we found topics that can be considered as the main lines of study. One of them is that despite the fact that it's very attractive or it's very appealing to see data as private property, there are many limits to this concept and we hesitate to call them so. First of all, with private property, it's very easy to uh, establish limits around it. So when you have a house, it's very easy to determine where it starts, where it ends, and what belongs to you. With data, this is not so easy. First of all, because there are there is very sensitive information that should never be turned into, da into data, that should never be digitized in such a way that it can be used as data. First of all, because you can argue that privacy has already been violated or breached and also that data is already at risk because it can be stolen, it can be lost and can be used in different manners. Brenna Rieser has called this the problem of the black box. Uh, certain aspects of privacy should never be turned into data. Also, in, secondly, Private property can be exchanged among actors that can be seen among, uh, like peers. A house is a house and it might have the same use or uh, value for a government, a company or a private person. But this does not happen with data. For you as a private uh, individual, data are not so important. Knowing your birth date for you is not really useful. Uh, but for companies that can handle billions of data, such as your date of birth, this can be very valuable since they have the means to process them uh, in a way that can make them earn more money. And this is an unbalance that is key and it makes it difficult to place value on data. There are some studies now that tell us that if people sold the data, they could 
earn, for instance, one euro a month or one euro a year. However, for a company holding billions of data, the, the value of such data is very different. Thirdly, when you are the owner of a house, you have a full legal right to uh, sell that house, but with your data, this does not happen because your data are also um, connected to other people's data. For instance, your genetic data also have a lot of information about your children, your parents, even distant cousins that you will never get to meet and your data might have some effect on them. So one of the main discoveries that we made is that private data are not as private property. Another of the aspects that we found through the study is that many of the ethical problems that we are facing right now come from an asymmetry of power. And until we handle this, no matter how many policies we might have, we will not have an ethical uh, handling of data. So part of the challenge is to how to empower the regular citizen, your your regular neighbor, to have more power on their data. There are very promising uh, methods such as differential um, privacy, but we need to invest much more on these methods. If we invested just a fraction of what we invest in uh, artificial intelligence in protecting privacy while we use the data of uh, people, we w could make great uh, progresses. So I recommend that you download the report. Uh, it's very interesting. It has uh, links to all the different parts of the study. And I will leave the floor to the panel. And I want to thank you again all for being here today. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, allow me to welcome you again in this space and Espacio Fundación Telefónica, a great place for reflection in the very heart of Madrid. And also in the very heart of everyone's concerns is the privacy of data. And I have the pleasure of moderating this debate today with an exceptional panel of ex experts where we have Ricard Martinez at the end of the table. He is the director of the chair of privacy and digital transformation in the University of Valencia. And he also uh, was part of the group of experts of the government on of digital experts. We also have Karina Bold, who has come especially and specifically just for this event. She is a researcher in the University of Cambridge. We also have Christoph Steck. He is the director of public policies in Telefonica. And Carissa Veli, who all, you all know already. Uh, she has been coordinating the project for the Center for the Governance of change in the EAE, but she is also a researcher in Oxford. My name is Raquel Carretero. I am the responsible of uh, public policies in, in Fundación Telefónica, and we will start um, having the thoughts of the panel members today, and we will finish with some Q&A so that you can also um, add your opinions. I would like to mention one of the data uh, from the report and uh, almost 90 percent consider that privacy is one of the highest risks that we are facing not only as users or governments or, gov or citizens but also as a society as a whole and I would like to ask Arisa um, to ask her how what she thinks about this data and so she tells us how the privacy concept has changed in the past years. It's very interesting because privacy has been a value that we have had for many years. The studies have demonstrated that all human societies have valued privacy and digital era has made us forget this lesson that we had learned for many years or almost all almost a decade, Facebook managed to convince us that privacy was something of the past, that it was unimportant, that we had 
that we were past it. So we are having to relearn the value of privacy uh, by being hit by things such as the case of uh, Cambridge Analytica that, that showed us that it could the data can the privacy of data can actually put into risk of a whole society but also by seeing many uh, personal cases such as uh, being stolen of our credit card numbers well this question f was for karina but please uh, all the experts m can intervene anytime they think they they want to add something so karina what is your thought on this has this uh, the concept or the idea of privacy change in, in particular due to the new developments and new progresses what have you been able to find through this research um well i agree with with everything chris has said as well um one thing oh, <laughs> And <laughs> <Okay. laughs> um, so, so one thing that I find interesting about the question of why we value privacy and and perhaps why we've stopped valuing it is is that question of what what has changed there. And so um, in in the literature on uh, on sort of the nature of privacy and the value of privacy, there's a debate about whether or not we value it for intrinsic reasons, which is to say it's a good in itself. Um, or whether or not we value it for extrinsic reasons, which is to say because it protects other goods. So you can ask yourself, um, you know, why do you value privacy? Why does it matter to you? You know, Carissa has a great article saying, um, you know, most of us have nothing to hide. So why is it that we are concerned about privacy if, if we don't have any secrets, let's imagine? Some people will say that uh, you could imagine two different lives, one in which you're uh, always being watched and no harm ever comes out of always being watched um, but it just it just remains that you're constantly being surveilled um, which life would you rather lead the one that's identical but you're not being watched or the one where you are being watched right <laughs> so I think most of us think well we'd, we'd rather not be watched even if no harm comes from that um, and so that suggests that there's a kind of intrinsic value to privacy um, but that's not to say that it also doesn't have extrinsic value. So it's also, I think, um, historically been thought that privacy is a good for protecting things like dignity and fairness and our ability to form intimate relationships with people, um, things like self-development. And what I've argued recently in, in, this, in this report is that it's valuable for protecting autonomy. So in particular, certain technological advancements around how much privacy is being how much of our data is being collected and how it's being accessed by companies, and then more importantly, how that data is being used. So in particular, to target us with advertisements and to get, get to know things about us, suggests that that's uh, leading to a, a sort of a strengthened link between privacy and autonomy. So it, uh, it gives companies the ability to affect your decisions and to manipulate your behaviors. I will keep one of the ideas that she has mentioned. Why should uh, we be worried about privacy if we have nothing to hide? Ricard, the study and your sentences, what you have said, well, I come from the university, so I need to apply uh, critical thinking on everything I read or I hear. The study uh, gives me a um, uh, contradictory uh, feeling. Sometimes you cannot study uh, speed and position at the same time and experts in f quantum physics tell you that the experiment changes in as much as you observe these elements and uh, the Americans say that I cannot define privacy but a judge can determine what privacy is as soon as they see it. That is to say, if you submit a population to a survey where they can uh, understand that there is a, an underlying uh, conflict, obviously they will value their privacy. But in real conditions, for instance, with my students in the classroom, what they think about privacy and what they do in real life, the results would not be the same for sure. When I am aware of my privacy, in a Automatically, I understand what's at stake, but our society is not educated. The privacy culture has been lost among the younger ones. It's not taught at schools. So if we start from, uh, I just stroke you with a, an issue regarding privacy, your answer is very clear. But um, 
if we took these people and put them into place them into a lab and have them browse the web without asking them any questions would the result be the same so this is why i have contradictory or mixed feelings about the results of the study because if i ask you you of course will be concerned but what happens on your day-to-day -day life what happens with the children in primary schools right now and that are growing and i will find in the university later carissa I don't know if you have been able to see this trend that uh, Ricard mentions. Uh, yes, he's very right. And this is what the experts call the uh, privacy paradox. There are many hypotheses about this. One of them is that people feel powerless, that regardless of what you do, there are so many trackers in the Internet following you that it doesn't matter how careful you are you will be losing your privacy anyway. So people just say, oh, I give up, I'll just relax and have fun. However, we are seeing that there are new trends, especially among young people. Relatively sh a short time ago, I read two interesting articles, one of them, I think it's in Fast Company, a 14-year-old girl complained that her parents did not allow her to get into Twitter or Facebook until she turned 14 and she didn't uh, complain about that but when she did when she finally turned 14 uh, she saw that her mom had been posting pictures of her since she was one year old and she was very pissed about this and she wrote an article about this this is not so much this it's not so true that uh, young people are not concerned about privacy uh, this is one of the conclusions that we have seen in the survey that there is no difference in the age range of the uh, people under the survey there's another article that was published about a teenager that was very upset about pri privacy policies of instagram but uh, teenagers and well every human being but in particular teenagers we have a, a need of belonging and so when she wanted to belong uh, to this world but at the same time respect uh, our own privacy they have developed uh, obfuscation uh, practices which is something to cover their attitudes for instance they many uh, boys and girls share one single account so that the information related to that account uh, will have information from a 16 year old girl and a 15 year old boy and a cousin living in the United States that starts using the same account and you see groups of 20 people who are changing and are using the same, uh, the same accounts in order not to provide their data in an individual manner and so they have their own rules about what can be shared and what cannot be shared etc and I think this type of practices will uh, become more uh, usual more common until there are companies that offer this type of practices as a product now we still need to have the view from the companies. I think that we are all aware that two weeks ago, the European Commission launched the new digital strategy for the coming uh, four years. And there are two things to be highlighted here and relevant to the, what we're dealing with today. One is the strategy about data so that uh, we have a common environment that uh, of data that benefits companies, citizens and government. And there's also a way paper based on that based on trust uh, needs to allow um, more power of experimentation for the companies and governments while protecting privacy of the users so Christoph what is your opinion on this and what do you think European companies and the telecommunication companies that can prove up add to this to this uh, debate well, I think it's very interesting to have the European Commission presenting this type of strategies because I think that five or seven years ago this would have been impossible. So I think the importance of this topic has improved so much that the President of the European Commission, together with two um, delegates, uh, have 
sat down and presented the European strategy regarding digitization and the protection of data. And this actually tells us about the importance of this topic. And I think that they have done a good job. I think that the strategy covers all the aspects that need to be included in a very ambitious strategy, including uh, an idea about Europe having a tradition of values uh, that differentiates us from the, for instance, the Chinese environment where uh, a party wants to have access to everything that is going on in its society and also differentiates us from the Americans where uh, companies can freely use the data uh, as long as they fulfill certain requirements. So I think that we see Europe trying to find a third path, a third way in order to have an economy that uses data, that is innovating in the use of data, but at the same time that it focuses on people and protects their privacy. But if we manage to do this, this would be having the best of, the bo of both worlds, having privacy, but at the same time having a flourishing economy that is more efficient, that is greener, that is uh, better in the use they make of uh, we make of data. So they offer several paths. First of all, to create a common space for data in Europe. The idea behind this is to uh, put together all the data from many companies and uh, governments and authorities in order to generate a data pool that can be used, for instance, to. Uh, to uh, input them into algorithms for machine learning, etc. To be able to do this is complicated because we need to analyze the data and make data portable, etc. So standards and initiatives need to be uh, created in order to uh, tackle these issues because Europe holds a lot of data, but they also involve people from other uh, parts of the world and they can flow outwards and they do not generate value right now within the European borders. So it's important that we try to uh, make these data usable for both companies and governments. A second step would be supporting the individuals and protecting the individuals' data. So they focus greatly in the control of the personal data by the uh, user, by the interested party. And this should be guiding the protection of uh, data around the world. And I think this should be key for all the countries who are creating data uh, and handling and processing data. They need to be they base themselves on the GDPR. And I think that the idea of the individual having control over their data is key in Europe. However, in, in Telefonica, for instance, two years ago, we created the Digital Manifest, uh, manifest and where we explained our vision that is human-centric. And what we said basically then is that we wanted innovation, but at the same time we wanted to protect data. The way to reach this goal is the complicated part. We need many more ideas and we need to experiment much more in order to realize this vision that is a beautiful vision. Christophe just mentioned that the path is complicated. I don't know if from the academic world we have any t tips to walk this path or if we can use these strategies from the European Union to protect data better and also to exploit better the potential of companies. Ricard? Well, I can tell you of the experience that uh, around 300 uh, experts from universities have been developed. And I can add my own experience as a researcher. We are not talking about a theoretical framework, but about people who are trying to generate data lakes in order to use them for the common good. The What we are facing with this is a regulation that is very strict 
the GDPR, the human centric based on key values is, is uh, essential. But we're also facing some structures and the documents that have been mentioned are very interesting because we see that we still do not have solutions based on the material reality. We are facing solutions that are theoretical, that are lab made, that are in the line of be careful and just apply the GDPR. But uh, let's be serious, I need to work on the field. For instance, we are going to work with over two million of uh, medical records and I need to be able to establish con a certain control on the data so that I prevent third parties to access these data or uh, hold these data and we need a qualitative um, step forward and this needs a cooperation between the public and the private sectors. We cannot depend only on solutions that come from the top to the bottom, from the regulating authorities to the society. There are many reasons for this. First of all, because the experience of reality uh, from the um, uh, companies is very rich and also because we have great experts on privacy on the this side of the fence, experts who are dealing on a daily basis with the, pri the, the issue of privacy of the data. So it's very nice to have guides and recommendations, but we need to bring this down to earth and we need to face uh, issues and challenges such as creating a data lake for the health sector with all the challenges that this entails that are great challenges and we need to come closer to that. The theoretical time is a constant time, but now we need to ground this, to land this so that this economy is becomes something real and maybe we're not doing this in Europe at the moment. Um, what about the uh, business sector? Do you have any uh, initiatives, for instance, self-regulation or uh, in order to assess these things or are we just uh, complying with the GDPR? Well, GDPR is the basics. Um, we could not sit down here and just say, hey, I'm not fulfilling the requirements of the GDPR. So this is key, but we need to move towards a philosophy of the ethics of data. Um, I think that the report and, and Karina and Carissa have also uh, dealt with this. Many people talk about this as if it were oil that you can simply transfer, but this is really connected with the dignity of the person, with the essence of the person, and with what really is at the core of our society. So we need from the companies uh, to develop a view and a vision that we need to handle with a lot of care. In Telefonica two years ago, we created an internal policy, a global internal policy regarding the use of data. And as Pablo mentioned before, we have uh, certain principles that we have uh, Im imposed on ourselves and we use it within our company. And it doesn't matter if one of our customers in Madrid, Berlin or Sao Paulo, this is the rules that we stand by and that we apply on in our work. So on the one hand, we have the national legislations or European legislation, and we also have the private policies that come from each of the companies that obviously need to fulfill the requirements, but sometimes they go further. And I think that this system of having a governance uh, that has several levels is, is very positive because they do not clash uh, against each other. Um, but what we need to find is the innovation to be able to provide transparency and to give the control back to the people. It's very easy to say, but very hard to accomplish. Pablo mentioned that we wanted to uh, publish the Data Privacy Center. And the idea behind this is to have an interface with the customer so that they can have statistics on their data and, and control the use that we make of their data. In, in a more appealing way than a simple form and uh, the check the boxes, uh, accepting all the conditions. So 
In this way, they would have the possibility of choosing uh, the way we use their data. And sometimes we change our opinions and this needs to uh, move in a flow and be presented in a way that is accessible to the customer. People might not, all, not all people might like this. Sometimes people might say that um, they, they do not care, they, they do not want to do or have so many choices. So we need to be aware that there are different opinions in society about these topics and we need to establish processes and systems that also take into account these differences. And I think it's a very positive initiative from companies such as Telefonica, but there are other companies as well who are taking this topic very seriously and they want to be part of the innovation and they want to move forward, but at the same time we need to be very aware of the fact that this cannot be done by exploiting the privacy of the people. Christophe just mentioned uh, a concept uh, regarding the ethics of data. And this is the focus of Karina Vold's study, how we can use this data in order to provide personalized or customized services such as advertising and at, to what extent this can be acceptable. Would you like to, Karina, would you like to share with us the findings of your research? Absolutely. Um, so I, I agree a lot with, with what's been said here. So that, that for one thing to note is that a lot of people have different opinions on this. And so it's not, it's not obvious that for every person that there's going to be one outcome that, that is it seen as acceptable. Um, but some of the work that I did with my co-author, Jess Whittlestone, was to look at some of the ethics that have been suggested for nudging in the real world. So what's acceptable for how we change people's choice environments to get you to behave in certain ways. And governments have been doing that, especially in the UK, for a very long time. And as some of what has been found previously is that public acceptability um, seems to prefer things that are um, transparent and that align with people's uh, existing interests. So rather than trying to, let's say, target you with an advertisement, um, which is something that wouldn't align with your natural interests, but trying to align with the interests of the company, uh, we're more willing to accept uh, a kind of nudge or a targeting that does align with something that we've previously expressed that we want to do. So for example, if I wear a Fitbit, I'm okay with that nudging me and buzzing me and sending me advertisements to try to get me to move around more because I've, I've sort of expressed just by buying that that, that I want that. Um, so, so there's some divisions there. Um, and then, of course, one thing that we worried a lot about with um, targeted advertising. Um, so, of course, advertising has been targeted in, in some respect for a very long time. So just the, just the ability for a company to choose to show um, advertisements for children's toys during the Saturday morning cartoon hour. That's a kind of targeting. Um, but nowadays we're able to uh, reach every single individual, you know, as an individual because we all carry around these personal devices. And so that leads for the opportunity for each of us to be shown very different things even when we go to the same website. And um, so in other words, it's sort of a it allows for the possibility of there to be a kind of manipulation of reality or a misrepresentation of what the truth is to show you different things. For example, your newsfeed could show you totally different content, content than my newsfeed. And that seemed particularly problematic to us as a way of using personal data to sort of reflect what the world, what's going on in the world and changing that reality of what's going on in the world. And um, so a concern about misrepresentation was important to us too. Yeah, so those are some of the considerations that we were thinking about. Beyond the negative impact, is there a possibility for the user to have uh, this personalization that is aimed at them in order to profit from this uh, data that it goes beyond monetization? I quite caught the question on that one. Maybe you could repeat that. Yes, uh, sometimes we cannot only value the negative impact due to the customization of services, for instance, when we're using a particular website, but there's, there might be also an opportunity for the user to be willing to receive a certain content or service specifically created for him or for her because this is connected to the interests that they're looking for or this can ease the the way to finding what they want they're looking for do you think that the user can consider this as a positive value 
Absolutely. I think if there was no positive outcome for the user, it would be easy for all of us sitting here to just say, let's just ban targeting altogether. But in fact, we all experience this as, as a good in many instances. So that the fact that you know, YouTube can recommend to me what I really want to watch, or the fact that I can get prioritized on my Google searches what I actually need to see, um, you know, there's just, just countless examples of that. Um, whether those goods always outweigh some of the negatives, I think is an important question. So the, and I think Chris's point earlier on is a really good one, which is that the, the negative outcomes of trading off our privacy are not always obvious to us. Sometimes they're hidden and sometimes they happen, um, you know, they're removed from when we give that initial consent. And so I think that's a really important point so that even if the positives are felt, the negatives might not be felt immediately or might not be felt at all. And um, the same is in some sense true for the positives. So there can be positive sort of common goods that, that come from us sharing personal data. So if we share our health data, even if my health data isn't that interesting, it could help the common set to help people who are more vulnerable if we're able to do some medical analysis and use machine learning on that sort of collection of data. So there is some evidence that people are willing to trade and willing to donate their information in a sense if they understand that there's a common good that can come from that. So that's also a kind of removed good. Um, but, but what happens with that data, I think at this point, is just so unclear to the average person. Even to us scholars, it's very hard to understand what is happening to that data. And that industry behind the scenes has been, I think, in a sense, built to be confusing. Um, and so if, if we get clarity on what's actually happening with it, then we can start to make genuinely informed decisions about what we think is OK and what we don't think is OK, rather than it just being a kind of hazy cloud. For this type of cases, how can Telefonica protect their customers or how do you see yourselves protecting your customers while at the same time moving forward in your business model? I think that we have also talked about this today. Um, it's all about transparency and control of the data. And I think in this sense, we are trying to uh, open um, innovative paths. And it's not easy. And um, we are going to experiment different ways of doing this. But I think it's very important to try to walk this path at least because the use of data is also very beneficial and we are always thinking in black or white and uh, to uh, to talk of an example uh, years ago the big data in tele team in telefonica they studied the tika virus and they studied if the government had uh, taken the uh, efficient measures to control the epidemic and the truth is that we found that the governments were not using the right measures because they were telling people not to get out of their houses and they when we move this data into the mobile uh, world, we realized that very few people uh, actually complied with the recommendations and people kept uh, doing the same thing and nobody uh, followed the advice of the government. So these measures were inefficient. Uh, what we found out was that uh, maybe closing squares or making taking more invasive measures would have been much more effective and i think this is a, a very small example but when we are dealing with the coronavirus as we are right now it's very um, telling and so i think that if we want to improve societies and i think that we really need to use data but how can we establish a difference so that how can we make sure that nobody can tell that I am here at this moment or and just say that there's a group of people in this place at this moment so have um, not so personalized data um, sharing I also like the idea coming from Europe that tells us that we want to get to this world where people can trust that we are using their data in an appropriate manner, but at the same time, we want to provide services and we want to add value to w the products and the businesses that we create and provide. Also, 
not all data are personalized. For instance, an automated uh, company or plant creates a lot of data that are not personal data, and we can use all these data without affecting privacy. And the European Commission says that with a very uh, de well-developed industrial uh, base, and being in the avant-garde of the world could actually use all these data to improve the generation of value and to uh, develop further. So these are all things that we need to take into account, but all, always uh, or never forgetting the, the, how sensitive some private data are. The borders of ethics is key. From the academic world, I would challenge you to find uh, degrees that are uh, um, given degrees uh, regarding computing and ITs, etc., uh, provided by universities that also include legal aspects or ethical aspects in their academic programs. And I think that we are facing many different uh, difficulties but you were present you were talking about something very important would the client want us to have their information customized i think this raises several questions it's not the same thing to have customization as part of the service delivery and to talk about a customization that is the business itself these are two different concepts we might think that there are many regulations for this environment, but Karina has talked about minors, and I challenge you to find any article regarding the uh, law about advertising dealing with minors. For instance, we know that we show an advert uh, in the morning or in the afternoon, but I challenge you to find any regulation about customization of the advertising for minors. Therefore, the ethics, not only as a philosophical matter, but as the uh, working group has uh, shown, the ethic as part of the, as a key right is an ethic of the fundamental rights with, that has essential elements that has uh, pointed out Christophe and I am totally ready to accept uh, customized medicine. I want my data to be very well analyzed in this field by the health sector. I, do, I am very um, I support any mobility studies so that the government can improve the policies towards greener actions and uh, respecting the environment and protecting the cities. I do not see an issue with that because we're talking about scenarios that are actually reinforcing my rights. The problem here would be guarantee. What are the legal uh, criteria? What are the, the, what's the trustability? of the data processing here. These are questions that we need to raise. The companies and also the public sector cannot wait until laws are developed for each aspect. The ethics of the fundamental rights and the ethics of the uh, regulation needs to be uh, underlying our design. The fact that we should not hurt others was said by a philosopher in Rome 2,000 years ago. And um, I think that this ethics related to the law needs to be incorporated to our daily work. This is because I, I, I was asserting, I was moving my head nodding before because I fully agree with Karina and what Christoph said. Many, uh, Alvaro uh, presents a question or tells us that a philosopher says that users should receive value for the data, but he wonders about the price of value, uh, for instance, in Europe or in the United States, if a data would be have the same value depending on the social class. What, what's your opinion on this? And this is a question for everyone. Obviously, the value of 
the data is one of these things that we have not very clear in our minds. Obviously, this depends on the model of value generation. The actually, uh, currently, the uh, value generation model that we are applying today is um, using the data to provide advertising to people. So we could maybe look into the value flows or value streams to determine the value. But uh, there are certain studies that the tell us that the data coming from a person from Japan or Europe or uh, the United States um, are more valuable than one uh, than a person than the data from a person in an emerging country. But I don't think this is the right way to approach the value of data. I think that the value depends on who is using this data, how much data do you have. Oftentimes what we call the insight based on data really has the value. So the insight is the raw data but developed and process, processed in a way that generates value, whether for a government or a company or an individual, a certain uh, value. So we do not have a unit of measurement for the value of data, but we need to be aware that there is an exchange of value here, that there are ideas that go be further and uh, say that since we are going to be out of work in the future because robots will be doing all our work, we will have to live on data or off data. This is almost a philosophical uh, debate, but they move us towards the importance of data in our society. And if it were as important as money, for instance, we should have to reconsider the uh, model, the economic models. I think some of the things that Christoph has raised are symptoms, or rather, of why data are not considered as private property. Also, when a company, for instance, gathers information, for instance, an insurance company, gathers information, these data will be more valuable for that company in particular than for a clothing company, for instance. So the same data has different value for different institutions or organizations. Another problem is the problem of the sensitive interferences. If they, sorry, sensitive inference, what is the interest of a company in buying our data if they just can infer it from our, uh, our, from tracing our, um, what we do? Anita Allen had a very interesting debate at the beginning of the century where they talked about the regulated market of privacy and how important was for the economy, the exploitation of data in order to generate value. And there was an underlying matter. And although I, uh, I subscribe the thesis from the research because at the end of the day, uh, the, all the work from the Supreme Court in the United States and up until the 1970s was related to the private uh, property and when they started to protect communications regardless or of where these information was gathered from and everything tells us of the importance of the privacy and the uh, relation of of the privacy as a fundamental right and I share this view but the person who uh, gives up their image gives up their rights in principle but the truth is that many business models are actually contracts for paying for privacy there's an exchange in which when the citizen is paying for a certain service, 
they also lose their uh, privacy and they lose their data. So data have an importance from the economic viewpoint and there's a relationship between the uh, legal aspect and the practical reality of things. And this creates a contradiction. If I were paying the company, for instance, if I were paying Movistar, I would be assisted by the regulations protecting the consumer's rights. But if I consent the, uh, to receive the service in exchange of my data, I would not have that protection. If, uh, Movistar, if, if Movistar services crashes, which happens very rarely, um, that I would be, I would receive an, um, an indemnization. Um, but, We have uh, many experts, and um, me uh, as well, have talked about the fallacy of the service. There are certain services that cannot be received if I do not consent in the company, you, if I do not give my consent to the company for using my data. And this contradiction will uh, last for many years. This is raising a lot of interest among the audience. They wonder if the user knows what is going on in terms of transparency and, and privacy. And there are many questions from uh, people regarding the education that should be given to the users so that they're educated and they understand the way their data are being handled and processed and what the consequences entailed are. Uh, this question is for everyone, but I will uh, take the word again. When we talk about digital education and about educating the future citizens and the current, uh, the, the adults, we deal with this from a, a negative approach. We uh, educate the citizen to protect themselves from the evil and that they need to be isolated from the environment. But the problem is that our citizens will be digital citizens. So what they need to learn is uh, management and to they need to know how to exert their right of control. So we're not talking about protection, not protection, or privacy and non-privacy, but their capacity of making decisions in a digital environment to, in order to trust, uh, to find um, trustworthy services and how to handle the whole environment in a safe manner. As an expert, um, you know, that many of you might know that I, I do not, I do not limit myself at all within LinkedIn. This is an environment that I use a lot and I do not limit myself at all. I will not mention many companies, but one of them keeps offering me uh, ads related to a poor lonely men who are looking for a wife very desperately. This is because, uh, the environment in which I, I am present in the internet I do not have any information about my personal life. And this is what I would like people to have, uh, people who can really navigate this environment. Yukich Online is a study that demonstrated that the ex exposure of risks, uh, the exposure to risks of minors in Sweden was higher than in Spain, but in Sweden, minors found parental support and were supported in their decision making when they encountered a risk. Uh, minors in Spain were lower, uh, less exposed to risk, but their risks were actually uh, more intensive. So what type of user would I choose? Uh, users who are very exposed but know how to handle the risk or a very low exposure but not really knowing what the environment is about? Carissa, could you please um, talk more about the differential privacy? Could this be a solution for this debate? First of all, I would like to add something to what Ricard said. I think it's very important to educate the users. We all know that our data are endangered, that we are exchanging data for services, but to what extent do we understand the details? So yes, advertising is customized or personalized, but how many people do understand that um, these data are auctioned, that they are 
your data are being shared by many companies because in the details of all these processes, uh, we knowing these details, we can really assess the risks. And going back to the education ethics, it's important to look into the medical ethics. Before 1980s, we didn't have this concept. Obviously, we had the traditional um, concepts such as no harming your patients and and let's see what happens. But it's very interesting to see how this has developed. Before the 1960s, um, doctors did not have any uh, courses on ethics. This has uh, grown very slowly. And I think in the digital sector, we need to learn from them. We have seen um, protests from Google and Amazon that are concerned about developing more ethical products, but they have never been taught about what ethics is or how to design an ethical product. And also they are, they clash uh, against their leaders who have their own interests and their own visions. Regarding differential privacy, this is a very interesting method because it allows for many possibilities. One of the risks uh, connected to any database, uh, let's imagine a database with uh, that has your name, your age, and your address. The problem is that this can be connected to other types of information. So someone who is doing a research on you can find another database where they you have uh, your name and also the social security number. And this is increasingly done so that they can find a lot of information about you. Um, so the idea is for not for so that no one can have enough information to uh, put your safety at risk. There are two ways of uh, working on this. Uh, there's a database where you have an original database where you insert mathematical noise, but also you can start with an algorithm that starts with the gathering of information. Aaron Roth gave a very nice example. Imagine you want to learn about uh, how many people voted in the Brexit referendum. A regular survey would call three or 4,000 people and would ask them, did you vote for Bre in, in the Brexit referendum? Yes, no. You would note it down and then you would run the statistics. The problem with this is that a uh, telephone number is a uh, personal data that can be connected very easily to a person. So what an algorithm uh, a differential privacy algorithm would do would be to you would call a person and uh, you would say you would flip a coin uh, and you would say depending on the result uh, heads or tails so if you if you get head you would say truth you would tell me the truth and if it's tails you would you would flip it again, and then if you get tails again, you would tell me a lie, but you don't tell me what the result. So at the end of the survey, you know that 25% of the answers that they got is false. So at the end of the survey, they can modify the data in order to find more accuracy. But there's not one single person that you can say uh, that uh, they voted for or against the Brexit. So it's a plausible deniability. Uh, and there's no way you can prove this, that what they told you is true or false. And this is very promising if we use it to gather the information because uh, from this point of view, we would never have any compromising data. Another question that is interested is just interesting for the audience has to do with the GDPR. We have mentioned it, but we have not gone in depth into it. Has it really fulfilled the expectations? Has it gone beyond the borders? And if the organic law from 2018 has allowed us to uh, give content to the main fundamental rights? Do you think that the GDPR has its shortcomings? Should it be um, should it be amended? I do not support extensive laws when it lacks um, 
accuracy and also there is a zipper effect. The GDPR provides 55 points in which we can have 27 different criteria and I have to face them when dealing with my research in the health sector and also there's been an abundance of guidelines by the regulators and this is really this really counterbalances the idea of having one single regulation which would be a very good tool and that really is uh, pushing other uh, legislations to change it could be very useful also for other uh, laws or that might take it as a base but at the same time there are so many different criteria and this race in order to publish the next uh, set of guidelines might really um, encumber the positive results that it can have and I think there's a lot of unnecessary noise. Many experts told the Congress that the uh, article number 32 talks about the duty of blocking and what could we do about this? There are uh, certain aspects like not being able to establish any exception about many of the regulations within the GDPR is also a problem. Many of the problems that are only acknowledged need to be followed up by legal actions that really turn it into a reality. For instance, the protection of minors, which is something that personally concerns me a lot. All the articles related to the protection of minors need to be developed within the organic law for the protection of the minors that has not been developed in the digital environment. And also other legal reforms that in, in our country never take less than two years. So many of the results will be visible not in 2019, but between 2021 and 2022. And this is something that really worries me. Beyond the fact that obviously uh, this is a global regulation and implementing it is complicated, I would like to challenge somewhat the experts that we have here today and I would like to ask them about their personal experiences, what they have done personally in order to protect their personal data and their privacy, something that can inspire us. I see that you're laughing, Christophe, so let me start with you. What have you done? Well, very well. I think that besides what uh, has been mentioned about using selective uh, services is changing my passwords very often because I have learned that by speaking with other uh, colleagues from security and safety, we are doing not so well in this field. So I have been changing uh, different passwords for different services because I was a bit lazy about it, as many of us are. And I think that um, I have improved my uh, practices by using two steps authentication processes and I think that I have done at least what I thought I could do to protect myself. So I think that privacy and safety are very uh, close, uh, closely connected when um, my email is hacked or my bank account is hacked. This is obviously very important. And Karina, what would you say? Sorry, I'm finishing. As, <laughs> um, I will say, I, I was going to say uh, two-factor, and I've seen even now three-factor authentication. Um, okay. It's often that whenever you can, I think, is the, is the right answer. Um, changing your passwords, of course, that's important. Um, one thing I've done personally is move to Europe. Um, so you guys, uh, you know, do have better protections here, although they aren't always perfect. And I think that um, following up on the last question, you know, one problem that I've seen with the GDPR is the onus that it puts on the user in order to uh, understand what they're opting into or not opting into. And that can still be better than, than what we had before, which is when you just weren't being told what was happening. Um, but the number of contracts as an individual that we now enter into is enormously more than we did 50 years ago. And it's, it's sort of the, the amount of decision making that we have to do in order to do that is quite, um, I think, impractical if we're thinking long term about every service we use. 
Um, for my own part, one thing I like to do is not just watch and not just like the videos and the sort of advertisements um, that I genuinely like. So I think it's helpful to view content that wouldn't necessarily be content that you, um, maybe political content that you would disagree with, um, in order to make sure that algorithms expose you to the stuff that, um, that you wouldn't otherwise choose to see. So this is a way to help yourself get out of the kind of filter bu bubble. And I think this is a strategy that a lot of people have been using and recommending as a way to make sure that the um, a system doesn't quite understand you know, what your political views are, doesn't make assumptions about what your political views are or, or other views. Um, so I think that can be helpful. Brevemente, okay. yo. Very, very briefly, um, as Christoph, my mobile phone works very poorly because I have all permits blocked, so all permissions are blocked. And also, I owe a lunch to a colleague because I got a survey that was very interesting, but they didn't ask me for my permission, so I refused. Uh, to f to fill it in, and uh, she didn't like it. I will explain why, but I owe her lunch anyway. In order to add on the European regulation, I would like to say that it does have uh, issues. One of the problems is it, it really puts a lot of responsibility on the user. But we need to remember that this has been a major step six years ago. We didn't even think or dream that this would be possible. So we are improving it. And I think that we will keep improving uh, all the mistakes that we've made. And uh, very lately, uh, I've been trying to use this legislation and there's a very interesting international campaign um, about the data brokers that allows you to write emails to the major data brokers to asking them to delete your data and to tell you what data they're holding and this is uh, this is done very easily and it's sent to all the major data brokers in my experience i also i would use uh, the privacy setting for the browser so for instance when you're trying to buy a, an airplane ticket if you use the privacy settings then you will get better prices so i could confirm this personally um i think i wanted to highlight the importance of the study in order to keep working uh, for a better privacy and thank you all for coming here and for being interested in this topic thank you very much